Congratulations. You got FL Digi up and running. Now, the next big challenge, dealing with all these variations of the op modes. What makes one better than the other? Are they different? Which one should I choose if I'm dealing with poor propagation? If I'm dealing with frequency drift? If I want to send an image? There are so many variations within not only the op modes, but the speeds themselves. And I'll explain all about this and what those numbers mean. And if you look at it, you'll understand, is it a baud rate? Is it in relationship to the bandwidth size? Or is it a combination of that? Or even throw tones in there. It can be overwhelming, but I'm going to make it simple for you. In addition to that, I'll give you my recommendations on which op modes you should use for fun that you'll find more activity on and the different frequencies you should use to look for them. And finally, I'm going to try to break this all down. I'll share with you an Excel spreadsheet so you begin to realize when we look at all of these different op modes, all of the variables that come into play when trying to choose the right one. So if this sounds interesting to you, let's get started. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KW3KW, and welcome to another episode of Ham Radio Made Simple. Today, I'm continuing a series on ham radio for prepping. This is episode number eight, and I'm in a series called the Digital HF Modes Part 6. Part 5 was on how to set up and use best practices with FL uh, Digi. And part four was setting up your PC as well as your rig controls in order to get all of this started. Today, I'm going over all of the FL Digi digital modes. And I've had people reach out to me and say they just get frustrated looking at that and have no idea which ones they should use, as well as if they get on a mode, there's no one there. Well, stay with me. I'm going to go through a lot of this, help guide you through those issues. If you're finding value, please hit the like and the subscribe button, not just for my benefit, but for those who are behind you that are having a difficult time finding a station like this. This is purely instructional. I'm not trying to promote any kind of product or myself. This is all about passing on my information to you in order to shorten your learning curve and you don't have to go through the pain that I've had to experience. There's no, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And I'm basically doing this so that others can actually have fun in a shorter period of time. So today's agenda, data mode principles, really, really important because once you start understanding this, it's going to make sense to you why there's so many different digital modes out there. I'm going to go through the three generations. I'm going to talk about error correction software. This is a key identifier on what makes one different, better, or worse than the other. I'm going to get into the overview of the digital modes. I'll go through all of them. I'm going to break it down by modulation. I'm going to give you my recommendations for both from a prepper standpoint as well as one to practice and just have fun on. So make sure you stay to the end because that's where I'll actually dig into this. But it'll all make sense once we get to that point. And finally, uh, I'm going to give you a, the spreadsheet breakout so that you can start to see all of the variable factors that play into consideration of these uh, different digital modes. And hopefully I do a nice summary so that you can walk away and say, okay, what's the most important things I need to know and remember when I, after watching this video? That's what the summary is all about. In this section, we're discussing the principles of HF digital mode. The first principle, and I call it basically the cause and effect of bandwidth. What happens when you increase the bandwidth? Well, you're going to increase the data throughput. It's faster. But there is a cost. There's a trade-off. It's going to require an increase in power, and the decoding errors may also increase. So conversely, when you decrease the bandwidth, it's going to require less power, less errors. And but what's the cost? It's going to be slower because less data throughput is occurring in here. And again, you're going to find as we go through all of this, there's a trade-off. If I do one, I have to give up something. So when you look at all of this, basically less bandwidth equals less power output, less errors, slower speed. Can you live with slower? Or can you do faster because the band, the uh, propagation conditions are good? But again, first principle, as I call it, the principle of bandwidth. Now let's talk about considerations in here. There are things you will have no control over and such as propagation conditions external noise, fading, drifting. Those are things that are pressed upon you. And then based on that information, you're going to have to make a choice on which digital mode works best for this particular challenge. So when and what mode? Really, it's all about band conditions. 
Another principle is you do have choices. What do you have control over? Well, you have control over the size of the bandwidth. You actually have, you can control what speed you're, it's acceptable for you. Are you okay with uh, speed versus accuracy? So you're willing to go faster if you get less accurate or you want total accuracy and you want to go to a slower speed. Again, your choice. And how much power output do you want to do? And again, from a prepper standpoint, you know, the ideal thing is, is that I can go low power, it's accurate, the speed is acceptable, and, it's, and that's going to be determined by a lot by the bandwidth and the propagation conditions. Now, don't forget duty cycle. This is, I call one of those little things that kind of sneak into the back. And remember what the duty cycle is. It's that total time during a transmission period that your transmitter is delivering power to the antenna. So let's say it's transmitting at 100% duty cycle indicates that you're using 100% of your radio's power 100% of the time. And I discovered on some of these digital modes, it does 80% duty cycle. Uh, so it only needs to operate 80% of the time, your transmitter. So again, another factor in consideration for you when choosing these digital modes. Once you can get your mind wrapped around the evolution of improving decoding and uh, the difference in the modulations that uh, came into the marketplace, it's going to make sense to you why there are so many variations of the HF digital modes that are out there today. And some of them, remember, are older technology are still used today, but they have been improvements. And my goal is to help direct you to those that are more innovative. So if we look at it, there are simple goals and objectives, as we mentioned it earlier in the principles. Increasing data throughput, faster speed, basically more words per minute typing. That's going to come through. Decreasing the bandwidth, we want less power, less errors. But it's all about, as I mentioned, your band condition. So the innovation is how do I punch through poor propagation, noise, drifting, and fading? With that goal in mind is where we start getting all of these different variations because that's the goal is what you're seeing right here. So if we look at the progression in here, if we look at data modulation, uh, AFSK was basically the first one, which is audio frequency shift keying followed by FSK, which is frequency shift key. And some of these data modes that, that are available today, I break it down and show you which ones are FSK. AFSK basically disappeared, it's gone. What you see today is FSK to a limited degree, a lot more PSK, which is phase shift keying, which is your binary phase shift keying and your quadrature uh, phase shift keying. And then uh, there's another classification that's called multiple frequency shift keying. And, and, and a variation of that one is incremental, incremental Frequency shift keying, say, say that 10 times fast. Anyhow, so you could see that uh, some of these are still in existence today. Basically, the majority are going to be PSK variations, these two, mostly this one, and MFSK, and this is the newest one that has uh, come out today. So next is the focus on error correction software. So let's look at the first generation that was out there, and it's known as uh, automatic repeat request, which is no longer in use today. And... It enables senders to receive and coordinate data transfers. And if there was an error you had to, was detected, you had to resend the portion. Probably remember a lot of this from your uh, general examination when you had to study on it. Bottom line is it's not around today, but it was an improvement over Riddy's error correction uh, and detection technique. Next, what you're gonna see is uh, Vericode. And that's somewhat out there today, not as popular. And uh, it, de it was developed for PSK31. And it was optimized for use with lowercase letters. And just a quick point here. When you're using these digital modes, get in the habit of just using lowercase letters. Don't capitalize. Um, it makes it go faster and there's less error problems. Even though some of them don't necessarily require it, it's just hard to remember going back be between di different digital modes. Just use lowercase letters. Now, also, the transfer rate is highly dependent upon data content when you're using Veracode. So there was another evolution. This is more current today. And that is what is known as FEC or forward error correction. And it's pretty robust. Uh, it's a technique to detect and correct errors in transmitted data. So you don't have to do a request for it in there. So there's no retransmission required. Each character is sent two times. That's how they get around this. It checks it both. And if conformity is confirmed between the two streams, it's accepted. So essentially, that's what FEC is. And it's widely used in the digital modes today. Let's take a deep dive in the progression of the HF digital modes. It'll help give you a foundation of what's out there and what's associated with what. And surprisingly, some of these older modes, first generation modes, are still available and being used today. 
So if we look at the first generation, we're looking at RIDI. And RIDI basically stands for radio teletype. And here's the equipment that you would see. Two operators would have to have this. Here's the keyboard. They would type it in. And it's radio teletype over HF. Uh, it, amateurs actually got to be able to use this in the 1950s if you could afford the equipment. But as far as it being around, it actually uh, predated the 1950s by the U.S. government. was used, I believe, late 30s and through World War II. Um, it evolved in the 1980s with the advent of home computers and software to replace the costly terminals. It's still being used today. You'll find it on uh, some activity on the 20 meter. It's on all bands, but probably more on the 20 meter. And it can be even used on VHF. Uh, typically, it's going to be found at the bottom of the bands near the CW. Uh, it uses FSK. And it's not very accurate decoding, even in good band conditions. But there are a lot of people out there that still like to use it. And there's even uh, uh, really contests. So for whatever. Next generation came along was Amtor, which is really uh, not used today. So pretty much just pass on that one. Pactor was the, was the next one that came in the 1990s. And uh, Pactor 3, which is still used today, uh, again, 20 meters is a high activity you're going to find on it. But as far as you and I, uh, just don't, don't regard it because its equipment cost is prohibitive. You have to use an encoder decoder device like this. That's why it's not popular at all. Too expensive to use. And again, believe it or not, there's just much better modes that are out there today that are free. So again, delete that one from your list of ones you're going to want to use. So when we look at uh, second generation, this is where we start to get into error correction software. And there's different variants of that, which I'll explain later in some slides here in a few minutes. So PSK31, Game Changer, used Veracode, error correction uh, software was introduced in, in, I call it, more robust way. Uh, really, really good. But off of the PSK31 family, you're going to find the binary PSK and QPSK. And they, they evolved instead of the Veracode, they're using the more current forward error correction software. So those are the ones that you're going to use. And by the way, and again, I'll break all this down, but the BPSK is sometimes referred to as PSK31, uh, which it really is not. It's not the original one, but some people will call it, and it's using the FEC. So just FYI. Another family tree of uh, different digital modes that can be hung on is the MFSK, multi-frequency shift keying. And it uses the forward error co correction software. So you got Domino EX, and off of Domino EX came Thor. Again, you see the progression and what ones are associated to what family tree. Also, Olivia, and then off of Olivia, Birth Contestia. And again, I'll break all these down, but you now know where they all came from. So if those who haven't watched my last video on uh, FL uh, Digi, what it is, uh, best practices set up and everything, the link is in the description below. But essentially what it is, it's really good software. It was released in 2007, continually being updated and improved. Uh, it can operate on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, easy to use. There's so many data modes included, which you see here. These are the data modes. And then there are what is known as either variants or submodes or format speeds that are associated with it. And it can be overwhelming. And that's what this video is trying to do is demystify and take away your fear when looking at all this and say, okay, I know what Olivia is all about. I know when to use it. So it's free. And there's a suite of supporting products that come with it that you can use. Uh, just two of the most more widely popular ones, FL Message, FL Wrap, which is going to be my next video I'm going to be focusing on. So if we look at the current and third generation that's out there that is not on FL Digi, then the focus has always been on lower power at the same time using being able to pick up weak signal conditions. So the signal to noise ratio thresholds can go from minus 20 to minus 26 dB. Very impressive. But there is a cost. It's a slower mode but you can pick up weak signals. That's a big plus. Now, many of them are not keyboard to keyboard uh, capable, um, but they're widely popular. FT8, FT4, basically I, I could say, um, put the spotlight on HF Digital, got a lot of people interested into it in the ham radio community. Uh, again, it, it doesn't do keyboard to keyboard, more of uh, station reporting, signal reports, et cetera, but it's fun to play with. It's also a great way to test your equipment to see how far and where you could reach. Um, software uh, was developed for it, uh, WJSTX, which it runs off of, which is really good software. And this is what it looks like. But remember this, it serves a different purpose. Uh, what always kind of bothers me is I call it ham radio snobs that say voice only or digital only or within digital, it's gotta be keyboard to keyboard, 
et cetera. Listen, it's a big tent. Let everyone have fun. It serves different purposes. Just enjoy what we have and be glad that we have the opportunity to use so many different uh, modes, formats that are out there. So if we look at ones that are keyboard to keyboard, but not on FL Digi, the one that comes to the top is JSA Call. And again, this is one of my top three uh, modes that, as a prepper that I want to use. And for anyone else out there, Again, I'll be doing a whole video on this coming up here shortly, but JSA Call is a top uh, a digital mode to be able to use. It's built off the FT8 platform, but not in partnership with, so it had to create its own software. It is keyboard to keyboard capable. It can do signal to noise ratios as low as minus 26 dB. Oh, that's so impressive. Uh, another one that's out there is WinLink. It has its own software. Again, a separate video on that one. It's basically HF email. It's a great product. I love it. It's in my top, again, three that I'm out there. Um, two ways to operate it. You can do gateways, which is basically connecting, uh, you know, to a, um, a node or a terminal that has gate, has internet connections, or uh, you can go peer to peer. And as a prepper, I focus on the peer to peer because if the grid goes down, the internet gateways will go down, but you can still do WinLink and it's really, really cool. One last foundational principle, and I promise you we'll dig into the HF digital modes. But let's talk a little bit about some of the best practice, key terms, and numbers. And I think a lot of this is going to make sense as we finally get into the digital modes. Just get used uh, to the habit of using lowercase letters. Some of them require it, some of them don't. That way you don't have to remember it. Uh, also get uh, into the practice of using shorthand, like back to you. It improves the throughput accuracy when you can send less uh, characters uh, transmitted on the HF. Make sure you do not overdrive the sound card. When, for, for myself, I'm a non-technical person. I didn't really understand what that meant. And they're telling you to turn down the volume, but how you do that in the digital world? Well, that's under your sound settings is one of the ways to do it. So if you go to Windows Settings, Sound, Sound Panel, this will pull up. So go under Playback, look at, you know, uh, under your speakers that you're using. Mine is the USB audio codec. That's for my ICOM 7300 internal sound card. It could, could show, for example, uh, plug and play, uh, PNP audio device. Make sure it's highlighted, click properties, go under levels and adjust it. There is no universal magic number that works for all of us. So you're gonna have to figure out what works optimally for you. And once you have that in, you should be good to go. Another way to go about this is de dealing with the RF gain on your rig. So if you can adjust the RF gain on your rig, and mine for my ICOM 7300 is the knob that's associated with the squelch, half of it is the RF gain, it has a huge impact. Because what we're trying to do here with an FL Digi is look at this key indicator. This is going to tell you whether or not your, your sound card is in overdrive. You want green, it's optimal. Yellow means you're starting to get out of good. Red means it's bad. Black means it's really bad. I, I've also noticed uh, other factors that impacted my sound card, such as a really high SWR. So make sure that it's just not only the RF setting, but it could be the SWR uh, from your antenna. So you're going to notice as you adjust the RF gain, it's also going to have a direct impact on what the waterfall looks like. So again, play with this, practice with it. This, this is all about the fun of ham radio is learning to how to use your equipment. Um, if you increase the gain too much, it's going to turn red. So you need to back it off. And we're used to backing it off on our voice side in order to pick up weaker signals. Make sure that the ALC is close to zero. You don't want a high ALC. Again, the lower the better. Now, when I get into these key terms as well as key numbers, a lot of this is going to make sense to you when we're looking at these individual uh, op modes as well as their, the variant speeds that are associated with it. So if I pull up the op modes, for example, here under FL Digi, you can see all the ones that are presented. But the format, or some people refer to variants, are what you see over on the right-hand side of it. And basically, I think of it as the speed of, of transmission to the speed of words per minute, for example, that is not only being uh, encoded, but decoded. So understand that each of these variants, excuse me, each of these op modes are going to have a default mode. For example, PSK 31, MFSK 16, anything else is considered a sub mode. Now, what these numbers reflect over here can be different. Uh, certain op modes are going to use uh, bandwidth in hertz. So PSK uh, uses hertz, 31 hertz, uh, 250 hertz, 1000 hertz. Small bandwidth, medium bandwidth, large bandwidth. And we went over the impact of what that means as you go from smaller to larger bandwidths. Others are going to refer to it as an FSQ 
is going to be the baud rate. If you notice the bandwidth, 290, 290 hertz stays the same, but the baud rate changes. So a 1.95, they rounded up to two, is what FSQ is, FSQ2. Same thing, FSQ3 is basically a three baud rate. Words per minute, 20, 30, 40, 60 increase. Now, when you get into MFSK, which I'll get into in one of the individual uh, uh, op modes that we are going to be talking about here, they're going to use tones and baud rate. So there is no consistency or standard what these numbers mean. It, it, every op mode has their own way of defining uh, you know, what their speed is going to be associated with, whether it is in hertz on bandwidth, whether it is in baud rate, uh, tones, tones and baud rate, it all varies all over the table. But now you understand what those numbers are associated with in each of these op modes, and it's going to make sense as we get into each of the family members. Okay, now it's time to dive into the various HF digital modes. The first one up is the PSK family of tree. And if you stick with me this far and you like what you see, go ahead and hit the like and the subscribe button. Greatly appreciate it. Now, we talk about the original PSK31. That's not in FL Digi. It's a different. And I'll get into that in the next slide. But you have to understand where all this came from. It was developed in the 1990s, um, and it basically sends one channel of data. That's important to remember. PSK, one channel of data. PSK31 was, you know, originally was its good weak signal for low power. It started to use a Veracode uh, correction software, error correction software, uh, used a narrow band, which was really the mode of choice for QRP or low power. But now we use the binary phase shift keying with forward, X, forward error correction software, and uh, which is more advanced than the Veracode as we talked about earlier. So there could be a confusion when you look at the PSK and it's basically pulling up over here, the variance is showing it's, you know, BPSK. It really is BPSK because it's sending two channels of data. It's not one channel of data. They're really not the same, but most people within FL Digi will kind of assume that they're the same, but they're not because it sends two channels of data. So we went from PSK1 to BPSK is two channels of data. And what's the upside from that? If I take PSK, the original 31, versus the BPSK, which you see in FL Digi, you're getting twice the speed at the same power. So by adding that extra channel, you can see the innovation, what it's allowing to do. You get faster speed, faster throughput. Really good thing. Now, the BSP, the, the BPSK 63 compared to the 31 is twice the speed and twice the power requirement. So every time you go up in the family of the BPSK, uh, you're gonna see more speed, but at more power requirements. And if you want lightning fast, you can go up to the 124, but the cost, again, wider bandwidth, but four times the power. If power is not an issue, you know, you still have power, not a prepper, you know, electricity is working fine, band conditions are great, you don't need to stay in the slow lane. And that's why you have all these variant speeds that, that are associated over in here is because band conditions, if they're poor, you drop down, you throttle down. If they're average, you go in the middle, and if and if they're working great, the band condition the propagation is great. You 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 know gear up and go for the faster speed. Again, assuming that power is not an issue. Now, if you want the turbo charge, you're going to get the quadrature phase shift keying, and so this sends four channels of data versus the two versus the one. And by packing all of that in, what you're you're getting is twice the data throughput at the same bandwidth. So remember. Uh, this is going to be sending more data through, and it's 31 hertz. This is why we have to uh, understand what these numbers are. 63 hertz, smaller bandwidth, wider bandwidth. Less power, more power, but the same data speed. You know, what, what you're getting the data speed up here, you can get it here at a lower one. But nothing comes to free. There's no free lunch. Uh, there is an increased chance and error rate with increased speed, but the upside is you get that reduced power for that speed gain. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, it's not a strong FEC mode. So most people say if the, the band conditions are not good, you're going to have to throttle back down or go back to B uh, PSK. Again, the choices are for you. You have options based on what the conditions are, and that's going to determine you know, what you're wanting to do as well as what power you want to push out in your rig. And th there's two more that I want to go over, and there's not much about these two, but just to break them out for you here. Uh, the PSKR is considered known as robust PSK. It uses the uh, um, multi-frequency shift keying Veracode, which is the older version. But by doing that, they're getting a 13% increase in the average speed. Uh, but look at this here. 
if you're using this, you're, you're going with, okay, look at the band uh, uh, width in here. So if we have a 250 hertz bandwidth and we're getting 110 words per minute, 80% duty cycle, but they're also varying the baud rate. So 125 baud rate with a wider bandwidth is going to allow you to go up to 110 words per minute. So now you can see why it's robust. So really super wide band, uh, 440 words per minute. I don't understand why you need 440 wor words per minute. Maybe someone can do it in the comment below. Uh, but it's also at a 500 baud rate. So there's trade-offs in everything that you do, but uh, it's fun. Try it, see what it's like, and let me know what you think. The uh, last one is really more of a, a, a two-meter VHF band, but it also does the higher HF bands. So it's called 8PSK, and uh, it does analog, obviously, you know, for FM. Uh, the 8PSK500 is the, the, the default mode, and it's used for all radios, all repeaters. And again, another video I want to do down the road, getting into the UHF, VHF digital modes. But if you want to get into it now, look for the 8PSK and do the uh, 8PSK 500 when you're using the uh, uh, two meter uh, VHF. But like I said, it does work in the higher HF, single sideband or FM, six meters and 10 meters in particular. Next, let's jump into the MFSK family tree. Now its roots come from uh, frequency shift keying or, or known as FSK and it uses two tones of frequency. Well, when we get into the multiple frequency shift keying, we can look at maybe, for example, 16 or 32 or eight tones. So uh, MFSK16, which is, is the default mode within the MFSK family, it uses 16 tones, whereas the MFSK8 uses 32 tones. So it can use 16 tones, eight tones, 32 tones. Why the variations? Because it's a question of how you mix the ingredients, how they mix the tones, the number of tones, the baud rate speed, and the bandwidth size. That's the combination that they try to figure out and uh, they'll mix those in different orders to be able to get the optimization with, for this particular HF digital mode. So tones are sent one at a time, but at a fraction of a speed. It's not like it's a long played out, like you know, uh, hitting a tone button on a phone or something like that. It addresses noise and interference. And again, the big stick, when you see with MFSK is that's what its, it's differentiation is, is dealing with noise and interference and, uh, and poor uh, band conditions. It also deploys the more, most recent FEC uh, forward error correction software, which is going to give you better accuracy. Now, its advantages over its predecessor, it uses more tones than FSK, but so what? What's that matter? Well, it's going to give you lower error rate and add on the FEC, big advantage. It's able to work with uh, low signal to noise ratio, such as minus 13 dB on the MFSK16. It's also uh, good performance and poor signal conditions. Again, that's what we're looking for when we think of the, uh, the family tree of the MFSK. So why use it? Long path DXing. That's why people like this. So when we look at the disadvantages in there, tuning is much more complex and critical and signal drift can be a problem when you're going to lose, it's going to fade in and out and you're going to get garble or gibberish when you're looking at your receiving screen on FL Digi. Uh, it's important that you have a good transceiver because you have to hold these frequencies for long periods of time. Um, otherwise, you're going to have issues. Two things to focus on over here is the bandwidth and the, the baud rate speed that what you see right in here. So... If you notice, it doesn't progress in an evenly orderly number, 154, 316, 218. But it does on the baud rate in here. It will uh, progress evenly that's on here. So again, what you're going to see between this, Olivia, Contestia, what they do is they mix the, the number of tones with the size of the bandwidth and the baud rate speed to get what they want at each of these format speeds for full optimization. So the next one up is Olivia. An Olivia is not a weak signal mode. People transmit on this at very high powers. I know people doing 100 watts and doing it because, you know, band, poor band conditions and they're traveling a long distance way. Uh, it is also one of the top decoding modes regarding uh, keyboard to keyboard. And the signal to noise ratio, minus 12B, very, very good. Not quite as good as the MFSK16, but still very acceptable. And again, it uses the combination of the number of tones, the baud rate speed, and the size of the bandwidth. Why uh, people are using this is because it really is, it's the top poor band conditioning mode that's out there today. If you had to pick one tool in the toolbox when you have the worst band conditions of all the modes, first one everyone goes to is Olivia. So 
let's look at uh, its purpose. And this is basically overcoming propagation issues and particularly the past. So when we look at the phase issues, for example, atmospheric noise and signal fading, interference, polar flutter, transversing a polar path, auroral conditions, sporadic E, you know, it, it, it's amazing what this thing uh, does and is designed for. And so why use it? Terrible band conditions and long distance DXing. So there are submodes also within Olivia. Let me just kind of explain a little bit here. And I think it's important to understand here, you can see uh, this one goes versus MFSK. The bandwidth goes in order. The, the baud rate not necessarily does it here. They'll change it and mix it up in here and the number of tones. So again, their combination is to get their results. And ultimately what you're looking for is uh, how many words per minute you can do it in. So uh, 8250 versus 8500, for example, you basically double it that's in here. So, but there's a cost to pay for that. Now, what are the popular modes? Default mode is 8500, but uh, 8250 is minus 13 dB. So if you're looking for weaker signals, that's the one you're going to want to choose. If you're looking for faster speeds, obviously, you're going to be uh, looking at something like, you know, the 16500 or the 32000. And what I really like about what I was able to uncover, when you're looking at Olivia, when you're looking at 80 meters, use the 16500. And the 40 meters, use the 8500 uh, as the your default mode when you're using it. Um, I wish I had more information like this, but it's hard to find it. But if I find something that's good, I'm going to pass it on to you. Why not use it? Well, it's it can be slow and lagging, especially when you're dealing with the HF digital nets for when people are signing in. Uh, it can be slow. So most people typically use something like Thor for these HF digital nets, unless the band conditions are really bad. Now, Contestia is derived from Olivia, another iteration, but it's a trade-off. It's between speed and performance. What do you want? If you can live with, with little less, but you get the speed, are you willing to use Contestia? I think so. I am, because you get twice the speed versus Olivia. But again, not as quite as sensitive on the signal-to-noise ratio, but it's still well with acceptable means and modes. And now, it works well on poor HF paths. I mean, you're not giving up much on that at all. Um, when we look at Contestia, it's going to reduce the character set. So in other words, here's what happens. You're going to type in uh, in the transmit panel on FL Digi, and let's say you do small capital letters. When you look at the receive, everything is changed into caps. And it's not going to allow you to use the pound signal, the percent signal, you know, these extended characters. Uh, it's just not going to. So don't use those. If you don't have to use those and you don't care if everything comes out in caps, it's a great one to use. Again, this one is configured, and, and, and I call it the, the secret sauce mix, is number of tones, the baud rate speed, and the bandwidth size. Why use it? It's faster, even under poor band conditions. I like this one. This is the one, the first mode I will try in reaching out with somebody is Contestia, you know, again, prearranged meeting. I'm not doing QSO on this. Prearranged meeting, I like to use Contestia, make sure we get everything working right, providing we're both using the uh, uh, RSID so that we can make sure we're matching on the same speed and mode. Now, when we look at within Contestia here, uh, you notice the bandwidth does progress in here, but the baud rate speed does not. It's not necessarily in a progressive order. And you can notice here, based on that, on here, it's like, okay, I get, I get something here, but I lose something here. I get something here to get faster speed, but I lose something on the next. So again, what you're looking at in here is how they're figuring the baud rate speed uh, is the defining factor within this where some of it might have been the bandwidth size could have been the defining factor as well as the number of tones. So what's, uh, oh yeah, just looking at this here. So when you see the number on here, this is the, uh, the you know, 250 hertz or your bandwidth size that you're looking at here. So the popular formats, default is 8500, but it doesn't mean don't shoot for the 120, one, the 4 125. For bad band conditions, it's, uh, you know, start with the 4, 125. Band conditions are great. You know, kick up to the 16, 500. Now, let's compare them. Contestia versus Olivia. Contestia wins if you're looking at a comparison as far as the 8, 500 is equal to the Contestia 4, 125. So a wider bandwidth here, 500 hertz on the bandwidth, 125 hertz, more narrow bandwidth on here. So... I can use a smaller bandwidth, get the same performance out of there. Smaller bandwidth means small, it means lower power and less errors. So uh, that's why a lot of people like Contestia. But again, you give up stuff. Uh, it uses a narrow bandwidth. It has lower power. 
Uh, but Olivia wins in certain areas too. It's, it, it'll operate slightly better under poor band conditions, especially on the lower bands. Um, has slightly better uh, decoding and slightly better signal to noise ratio, especially on uh, a certain particular format speeds. So when to choose? To me, it's all about band conditions. Uh, if the band conditions, you know, are pretty much same, then I'm going to look at how much power do I want to use and how much speed uh, as far as uh, going back in my uh, QSO and can I give up the character set. For me, I think the trade-off is worth it. Again, unless you're really dealing with super bad band conditions, this is uh, Olivia is the arrow you pull out. But if, if it's not so bad, use Contestia. As we dig deep into these next slides on the IFK modes, uh, the thing that's going to strike you is just the continual innovation and progression improvements of these uh, HF digital modes. So it's important that you understand what is IFK, and that's incremental frequency keying, which is built uh, off of the MFSK uh, platform. And what they're trying to do is improve the tolerance of mistuning and a frequency drift, as well as trying to work through bad band conditions, propagation conditions. At the same time, trying to take a bandwidth size, make it small, and push more speed through it. So from that came the innovation of the incremental frequency keying plus, which is current today and is one of the op modes uh, that is used in FL Digi. So it is, a, it's, again, another iteration. It's based off the IFK. What this particular op mode is known for is sending images, robust imaging. For example, you can do six variations of resolutions of color and three different resolutions of uh, black and white or they call grayscale. Uh, now, when you look at MFSK16, that does images as well as the other ones, but I think this is probably the mo most robust imaging capability that's out there. So if you're looking at sending images and you really want high quality, this is the go-to mode. Now, it can also you know, transmit text uh, over the HF, and it is more efficient than Domino EX, but you have to be aware that if you're using the 1.0 um, format speed, it has to be above 10 dB signal-to-noise ratio. The, the 0.5 um, format speed can actually go down to as minus 10 dB on your signal-to-noise ratio. So that one is probably going to be more the, defer, the default speed that you're going to look at. Now, it's in the look and feel of the screens with an FL Digi, very similar to FSQ, has the herd panel, call signs are added, but it also added a signal to noise ratio um, uh, indicator at the bottom of the screen. So, again, just a kind of a side point. I, off, I noticed that on the MFSK16, which does imaging, uh, it also has the avatar of the penguin up there. So, it may be that with an FL Digi, when you see this, it's basically saying it sends avatars, images, etc. So the, the next iteration off of the IFK Plus is uh, basically the Domino EX. And it doesn't require forward error correction software. Uh, it's very fast typing speeds at low bandwidths, easy to tune, tolerant of frequency drift, and used on the 30, 40, 80, and 160 meters. So uh, it was a great improvement. People loved it at the time, but wait, now comes Thor. And that's one of the top HF digital modes that are out there, Olivia, Contestia, um, as far as I call it power strength functionality is, um, Thor is one of those up there. So you really want to focus on this one. You really want to try this. It uses narrow band modes and it improved the speed through those modes. Again, no forward error correction software required. Again, what does that mean? It, it improves the speed if you don't have to have the extra coding running through the transmission. So by removing that layer, it, it improves the speed but without compromising and giving up the accuracy to what's being encoded and decoded. Now, it's superior to Domino EX in its FEC capabilities. Bottom line is it's basically fast and accurate within smaller bandwidth sizes. And it's easy to tune, fast response that are on it, a tolerant of frequency drift. So if you think of this mode, think of it as being able to have a small bandwidth, accuracy, fast speed, and works under poor conditions. That's why Thor is really popular even today. So if we look at the configuration, there, there's a lot of different modes, format speeds. But if you look at the default speed, that's going to be Thor 11. And Thor 4 is uh, commonly used. But if you're trying out Thor, try Thor 11. It was also designed for the Envis antennas at 80 meters. And for, you, for those who are new to ham, don't know what Envis is, near vertical incident skyway antenna. 
And I basically did a whole video on uh, on that, so you can actually watch that. The link is, is in the description below. And this, this, this band is good for the 20, 40, 80, and 160 meters. But for preppers with an Envis antenna, try Thor 11 at 80 meters. Next comes FSQ, which is, I did a whole video on that one. It's in the link below. To me, that is my most favorite within the FL Digi world. Uh, Olivia Contesti and Thor, all of them are top players in this game. This stands for Fast Simple QSO. Uh, think of it as a super chat mode because it does line by line transmission versus you know character by character. So it makes it unique. Uh, it's lightning fast, doesn't require any forward error correction software whatsoever. This one, you can not only send files and images, but you can relay messages. Again, if that in uh, piques your interest, check out the link in the description below. Really, really cool. Um, it's fast tune response. It's easy to use. It's tolerant of frequency drift. I mean, this is really uh, my favorite one because it's so unique and I call it lightweight. It's really considered almost like lightweight in what you're trying to do and work with. It it works under poor conditions, band conditions that are all in there. And again, um, if you really need to consider FSQ, especially if you're a prepper. And again, I can't tell you enough. If you haven't seen it, watch the video that I did on this one. The default mode, by the way, is 4.5. Now that we're done with the family tree of uh, HF digital modes within FL Digi, let's talk about, quote, the other modes that are out there that are not widely used or known of. So one of them up is the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is used in commercial uh, telecom uh, software. It does have advanced FEC capabilities built into it, but it's something I haven't tried, nor I don't, right now I don't see a need for it. But again, it's an option out there. Now, MT63 is built off of this architecture, which is used today in emergency comms on the 2-meter VHF because it can lose 25% of its signal and it still works perfectly, can still copy. It can uh, work with mistuning and you can use it 20 meters and above. So if you're thinking of a, uh, a VHF digital mode to use, MT63 should be your choice. And now we have something like throb because of the sound, it sounds like a throbbing pain. And again, not too popular, not widely used, has issues with fading, it's slow, um, no FEC corrections built into it, difficult to tune. I'm not going to use it. You probably won't either. So next, Hellschreiber. How about one that is, was developed back in 1925 over in Germany? And uh, this is what it looks like, CW for the eyes. More popular in the EU than it is in the United States because it does a, lo a low duty cycle. Um, how about trying this with another ham radio operator doing digital just for the sake of being fun and as far as uh, understanding what it was like in 1925 to try to do this, but they weren't using computers like we are today. Some massive equipment uh, was required to make this thing work. So how about some other not well-known modes? Web facts. Well, it's HF facts of images, something you're not going to use, I'm not going to use, but it is still deployed over in Japan as they're trying to send out articles to the fisheries. So Again, now you know what it is. Just make sure you, <laughs> that you uh, know that to check that off your list. You won't be using it. So how about ones to consider? Well, if you're bored, have nothing to do, and you want to listen to uh, marine safety information, then you might want to consider Navtex, which is one format. And the other one is Sitorp. And so Navtex is Navigational te Telex. And again, as I mentioned, it's marine safety and information to the ships that are out there. So if you're bored at night, try it. The other one is Sitorb. This uses Simplex Telex over the radio. The commercial name of that, but the ham radio name we're all familiar with is Amtor, which I talked about in one of the first slides in this presentation. And uh, again, if you're bored, got nothing to do, got good propagation, why not try it? Now the frequencies are 5, 8, you know, again, I'll just post them here. And if you want to write them down, go ahead and hit the stop on it. Uh, but again, here are the frequencies available for you to be able to listen to the marine safety information. Can you do CW on FL Digi? You bet. However, it's not the best decoder. Um, the best results when you're using it is stay 20 below 20 words per minute. It works, it works decently at 20 words per minute. But tuning is critical. You really got to know, you know, that narrow uh, band, you got to really uh, tune in and focus on it. So you may have to adjust your filters and it takes time to lock it in. The thing that I noticed when you're trying to tune it in is if you hear CW and there's a lower pitch to the higher pitch, more toward the higher pitch is where you're going to get the best uh, encoding and decoding across an FL Digi. Can you use a keyboard to uh, to transmit something? 
it surprised me. I didn't realize this until I dug into it. And the answer is yes. Uh, but make sure, that, again, you stay below 20 words per minute and no common CW abbreviations if you're trying to talk to someone who's a CW operator because they talk in a whole language of their own. And here's an example of just the common CW abbreviations in here. Now, this is what it looks like when I actually used it. And if you notice on the arrow here, this was coming in at 15 words per minute, and I was able to lock in the signal pretty clearly. And again, you can do a lot of that. Uh, and you can see, notice the frequency. It went down to 0.450. It wasn't like a, you know, uh, 045 or 046 or 0.5. Really had to tune in to get the decoding to work properly. And you can do that with FL Digi down on the arrows at the bottom to uh, get your offset exactly positioned over the transmitted signal. Um, the other thing is that if you want to go in and make some changes, don't forget, you can always go to config dialog, which is, you know, up here, config dialog. You go under modem, under CW, and you can change the default speeds uh, if you want. Right now, it should work. Um, but again, if you ever want to, this is where you would do it. And a tip, uh, work with your RF gain controls for weak signals. And it's another tool in the toolbox to help lock in that signal and get better uh, encoding and decoding when you're doing CW. So what are the fun ones to practice with? So you've listened to me through all of these uh, presentation slides and you're saying, okay, summarize it. I wanna have fun, I wanna use FL Digi, which ones should I use? Uh, BPSK31 is a good one, it's popular, a lot of activity on it. MF, MFSK16 or eight, you're gonna find activity on that one. Thor11 is the default mode, you'll find activity. Olivia, Contestia, 8500 or 4250, another one to go to. Uh, if you want to try to send images and practice and have fun, use the IFKB, uh, KP at the 0.5 format speed to send images. CW, I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to spend more time trying this. And with some of you uh, fellow listeners who have reached out to me and we've been starting to, to practice some of our, our gear and equipment together, let's try CW. Now, when the stuff hits the fan as a prepper, what are my top modes? FSQ, which I did a whole video on. It's in the link in the description below. It's fast, works great under poor band conditions. You can send files, images, and more. most importantly, you can relay messages. You want to know what relay messages is? Watch that video. Olivia, under terrible band conditions, go to mode. But if it's poor to better band conditions, jump up to Contestia because it's much faster. Thor, robust, all around, solid, can send images. That one you must know and learn. Uh, uh, the BPSK31, when you're moving into the low power modes and you want to conserve your batteries, that's the one to look at. And again, CW does low power, why not? So what are the key frequencies you want to go to when you're looking at particular modes and by particular uh, band? So for example, if you're wanting to look at like Olivia Contessia Thor, for example, on 40 meters, here are the ones that I kind of put together and found has a lot more band activity on. Um, and I broke it down for PSK, FSQ, and even the JSA call, which I haven't even gone over yet, and the videos. Uh, also, I put together just, you know, from the AAR, the AARL uh, listing of uh, this is the digital frequencies. And for the extra, uh, here's where the extension is. So if you're interested and you want this, just say, hey, MJ, uh, can you send me your digital frequency list? And just go, you know, at hamradiomadesimple at gmail.com, and I'll send those to you. Uh, one of the last things I want to go over with you is a spreadsheet I'm working on. It's still, you know, not done yet. So it's basically work in progress. But when you start considering here things like, you know, the modulations, the error correction software, is it low power, is it high power, is it narrow band, slow speed, high speed? And you kind of get the, the idea on the one side, but what about the band conditions? How about noise, fading, drift issues, tuning? Um, is it a, a good choice for the UHF, VHF, HF? Uh, what about the uh, Envis antennas, DXing, duty cycle, imaging? So I'm kind of trying to put all this together to get a, a good overview look at all of these different uh, FL Digi uh, op modes and figure out which ones make sense can, based on all of these conditions. So hopefully when I get this done, I'll make it available to you also. So the next four videos I'm going to do, uh, FL Digi troubleshooting and tips because I'm getting a lot of questions and people kind of run into something. And... And again, I'm, as, as I get better at this, I start realizing there are some tips and tricks that will actually make it work better. But if you don't get it up and running to begin with, I think I know what those are because I probably faced them like you are. 
Also, I'm going to go over Olivia Contestia and show you more about how you can use FL Message and FL Wrap uh, and when people use it within uh, these uh, op modes. And WinLink Vara, um, as well as uh, JSA Call, will be the following videos. So I appreciate you sticking this long, for those few who did with me. And so, again, I appreciate it. Hit the like. If you can hit the subscribe button and any great comments, I greatly appreciate it. This is MJ, KW3KW, with Ham Radio Made Simple, finally out.